Have you ever wondered how things are made? How we convert raw materials into the products we use? What new kinds of materials are being developed? And what does that mean for you in your life today? And this program will answer some of these questions. And we'll show you how material science is the field behind all of it. Because material science is in everyone's backyard. It looks pretty worthless, I know. Sand. Silica sand. You can make glass out of it. That's been done for thousands of years. Old-time prospectors walked right over it on their way to gold mining country. It looked like useless material to them. And for the most part, it was back then. But silica is the material that silicon comes from. Silicon powers cell phones, automotive electronics, computers, all that digital stuff. Silicon is what makes solar power possible. And it all starts with a simple material, silica. But you've got to know what to do with it. REC Silicon in Moses Lake, Washington, refines most of the pure silicon used by the solar power industry. They rely on material science to develop their unique manufacturing processes. Their silicon products supply a fast-growing industry around the world. And because of material science, silicon has changed our world forever. So, silicon. That's one material with a big impact, thanks to material science. And there's so many more materials out there, like algae. What do you suppose we can make from that? Then, of course, there are wood products. And then there's basalt, a volcanic rock. Who'd ever think of making fabric from volcanic rock? Every advance in any technology you can think of depends on advances in the materials. So material science is an all-encompassing field, and it, as Leslie and Bill pointed out downstairs, you can't avoid it. It's part of all of these different sciences that we're involved in. So just as the candy coating on an M&M protects the underlying uh, you know, chocolate from melting in your hands, so too does a thermal barrier coating on a turbine plate. <laughs> That's beautiful. Here at Central Washington University, they're learning about new ways of transforming minerals into metals. This is the foundry that supports the cast metals processes. So anytime you solidify a material in a mold or some sort of cavity, you have cast that material. Your car, your fridge, your house, you name it, there will be castings in there. If anyone has an interest in making things, you're going to have to have materials that are suitable for your idea. And so going into materials field is absolutely important. So if you want a faster computer, we're going to provide a more a suitable material. That'll be maybe silicon chips, maybe some other element, if you will, and in a pure form. The advances in those technologies, whether it's computers or medical or inspection, you name it, are generally tied to an advance in the material science field. So my name is Christina Lamassi with a company called Modumetal, and we're developing advanced nanolaminated alloys. So it's an advanced kind of nanotechnology and material science. Nano is just a size. It actually refers to nanometer. It's important because as things get smaller and smaller and smaller in this kind of application, they get stronger, they get tougher, they get more corrosion resistant, they get more heat tolerant, and so we're able to make materials that really do defy the laws of physics as we know them today. So if you, if you look here, you're going to see a solution. It's got kind of a funny yellow color to it. It's yellow because it has metal in it. And what we've done is we've applied an electric field here. So we're applying electricity and chemistry at the same time 
to make these advanced materials. Now you can't see it because it's nanoscale, it's very small, but when we do that, we get some really interesting properties in the material. So this is a Maji metal helmet that we made uh, using our electrocasting process. So it represents, we cast it from an original um, ballistic helmet and basically reproduced it in Maji metal. I've got two, two parts here. One is a, a Maji metal sample that has been um, fired on through a ballistic test and you can see the two rounds impacted and uh, the rounds did not penetrate the armor. At a college I worked for uh, a foundry which is like the prehistoric kind of pictures you see with the big ladles of 20 tons of molten iron. They actually, you know, they still do that and that's still um, a very valid method of forming parts. And, and I remember the first time I walked in there, I was born, I was like, wow, this still really happens? Okay, great. We're kind of going a whole different direction. You don't have to kind of play by the standard rules of taking molten metal and freezing it how you want to freeze it, then pounding it, the, pounding it in the shape you want, and then cutting it in the shape you want. We just grow it. It is like growing exactly the material you're looking for. And that's another thing that's really cool about Maji Metal is that we're not we're not mixing materials to produce a, like a bulk material. We're actually growing them from the ground up very much the way that nature grows materials. So the way an oyster might grow a shell or the way that you might grow your bones, we actually grow Maji Metal. I don't need enough candy. <laughs> yeah, you can do a lot with metal. And you'll find tons of metal, composites, and other modern materials in this brand new Kenworth truck. And this here is a 1924 Kenworth. It's our second year production. Um, these trucks were very much built for the rigors of the Northwest. It was a market that was needed to be met, and Kenworth was the one that did that. The trucks were very, very durable built as they are now. Kenworth trucks are usually used in extreme applications, so we have to rely heavily on material science to help withstand those applications our customers are using the trucks in. Our trucks are used all over the world. We're used a lot in the Middle East in the oil uh, producing countries. We're used a lot in South America for logging and oil exploration. Heavy duty mining operations throughout northern Canada and northern uh, Russia and in parts of Texas, Oklahoma. All right, this is a T660. This is the newest truck that Kenworth has introduced. And as you can see, in 85 plus years, the design and, and just the shape of the trucks has evolved tremendously. Whereas before we had metal cabs and hoods, now we're into composites. And this here is a SMC material, which is a sheet metal compound. It's a closed molded material that's very strong and very durable. Using the composite materials allows us to give us very strong material um, that handles very extreme applications and environments. But most of all, it's also lightweight, which is very important for our customers. Um, this hood used to weigh several hundred pounds, now only weighs a couple hundred pounds. But it's just as strong uh, and durable as the metal hoods that we used to offer before. This is Dylan Works, and here it's all about imagination. They invent and build dramatic environments for companies like Disney, uh, Turner Corporation, Sony, uh, many more. To do all this, you really need to know about materials. What do you hold? Oh, this is, uh, this is the Creature from the Black Lagoon's hand. At Dylan Works, we do, uh, we do a big variety of things uh, sculpture-wise. Sometimes we'll do uh, an item or a sculpture that may be 20 feet tall. Uh, all the way down to six inches or smaller. And so we have to be able to use different materials uh, for something that size, something small you might do in clay or wax, something 20 feet tall. We generally would use uh, this urethane foam right here. This is a good example of kind of us exploring different materials from an artistic perspective. Because most of our work is based on, you know, what does it look like? Does it look cool? Well, it kind of started with castles and dinosaurs and making them out of clay as a little kid. And then it went into Halloween and building models and mini miniatures. And, and that's kind of where I transitioned by doing props for Halloween parties and haunted houses. And, and that kind of went into the, the theme parks and that kind of thing. So, 
and I found out about Dylan Works about 10 years ago, and I had been pursuing that ever since. Uh, this is the mold shop. Um, this is where uh, we do most of our casting and mold making. We use a variety of materials in here, um, silicones, fiberglass, epoxies, urethanes, um, all sorts of things. This mold up here was for a um, Christmas display in Chicago at Marshall Fields. That's Willy Wonka's head. Uh, that's the mold casing that's next to him. There's always that next thing that you can like move on to from the mold work and you can incorporate the machining that we have the machines over here and other materials and it's a lot of fun. And you know there's a lot of different science aspects that come into it. Uh, just The list goes on and on. You can take it as far as you want to run with it and in here it's uh, pretty amazing. Material science is behind leading edge technology like these unmanned aerial vehicles. Here at In-Situ Corporation, they design and build these UAVs using super light carbon fiber composites. Standing before me is our Scan Eagle aircraft, baseline reconnaissance aircraft that we sell mostly to military customers at this point in time. The design was built around being as, I would say, uh, aerodynamically as efficient as possible. We want long endurance for its, for its flight characteristics, very low weight, uh, a very, very efficient operation uh, so it's little or no fuel required and can fly for a very long time. In our case, over 20 hours. In the materials world, the whole structure for the aircraft is built from graphite fiber, carbon fiber. This is a very, very light structure, but um, inordinately is stiff or stiffer than steel and of course much lighter than steel or aluminum. We, we do a lot of careful choosing and selecting of materials based on properties, characteristics, and the performance levels that we need for the airplane itself. Our dome lens here happens to be a, um, that's a uh, polyethylene material that has to be transparent to the uh, IR infrared range of, uh, of our optical sensor. Our typical dome for our EO camera for uh, eye visible uh, uh, operations is a polycarbonate lens. So same thing you see with your eyeglasses and things like that. Students have made some cool products here in the materials science program at Edmonds Community College. So these are the blades, right, for the windmill? Yes. There are four layers of carbon, and then there's a padding in between, a core, and then there's four layers on top of carbon. And then we vacuum infused everything so there wouldn't be any voids. And the base is actually surprising because it's carbon fiber, carbon fiber it's filament but it's filament wound around bamboo. It's for strength. So you can like, that's why they can stand on it and it's not breaking Doesn't right now. It's like there's it. no flex or anything to it. Um, this one is like more the athletic kind because it has the bow. So this one they made all out of carbon fiber. I'm trying to make these. You know, I'm trying to make these carbon fiber um, right now. What are those? These are just, they just keep your heels out from the swing arm. Basically, had this turned out, you know, you can see that, that that was that part I was pointing at. You don't have to look far to discover how material science affects daily living. It's behind the engineering for most of the products in this small backyard. In fact, whether it's for industry, education, art, or science, the more you know about materials, the more you'll be able to accomplish in your life's work. So take a look around at the world of materials science. It's everywhere. It's in all of our backyards. And the next time you wonder, how's it made? <laughs>
or what's it made from, go find out.